and this echoes a very common academic uh, uh, condemnation of what's happening on the ground level in classrooms and schools and communities and indigenous education. And very often they, they use Freire's argument uh, claiming that this indigenous refusal of government policy is understood as an, maybe understood as unreflected introjection of oppressive thinking by the oppressed, resulting in self-oppression, self-exclusion, and the imitation of mainstream colonial models. Um, I interpret this differently. I think there's more, it's more, much more complex than this. And if we are going to interpret it in this sense, then we are perpetuating our academic rejection of, of uh, the reality of ground level and the complexity of the reality of ground level. Um, and I would suggest that uh, we have, a, uh, as uh, Dr. Hartley used the term, we have an epistemological gap. We have an epistemological conflict which does not allow us to, to understand. So there's a, a, a lack of the official understanding in the intercultural issues. What intercultural means at policy level, unfortunately at ground rules level, it means the minority community has to be intercultural. The mainstream continues to be monocultural in its perceptions. Uh, and more, much more seriously, there's a misperception of the difference between education and schooling where education, by education I mean uh, something which is oral, traditional, performative, that's hands-on, and informal, it's not done enough within the four walls of a building, a classroom. And schooling, which is literacy-based, Western, modern, cognitive-based, formal, that's thinking, nothing to do, theoretical, nothing to do with hands-on action. Um, there's this misperception, so what, whatever's happening outside the school, is not education. And very often, as we've just seen in the previous presentation, the school houses are built by the federal government with federal funding, and they're not used. It's important for them to be built because uh, once they're built, it means that the, that community exists on the map of federal funding and policy. Because when a schoolhouse is built, it means that federal funds are going to come into that community in the shape of uh, salaries for cleaners, for cooks, and for teachers, right? So that, that community is on the map, exists. Uh, now, just because nothing happens in that schoolhouse does not mean there is no education in that community. So there's this misperception of the political role of schooling from the misperception the point of view of government. Um, inclusion, access for mainstream, access for citizenship, political power. This is what happens for those, in those communities. This is the perception in those communities that prefer to teach in the schoolhouse, in Portuguese, with the national mainstream curriculum. There's the official misperception of the connections between literacy, which is the general policy in Brazil at the moment, literacy for everyone, literacy and the national language, the colonial language, Portuguese. The connection between Portuguese as the national colonial language and Western knowledge. And the connection between Portuguese, Western knowledge, power, and politics. So what, what do we have there? We have a situation where the indigenous community since 1988 now have, have ceased to be wards of the state and they are now citizens. As citizens, their political participation in their own process of education uh, is much more active. If it's going to be active and the, and the policy permits this, they are not going to be spoken down to. Uh, they can perceive the connections in power and the access to power uh, and politics uh, between literacy and the national language. If they're going to be literate in their own language and learning their own contents, they have this anyway outside the class. So they see the, their reading of the present, uh, uh, this very permissive, progressive uh, policy, uh, and here I include myself in the people who contribute to this. Uh, what we were doing uh, is now read by these indigenous communities as uh, limiting their access to political participation and citizenship. Uh, there are lots of ironies in this process with which we have to be very attentive to um, and to reflect on what we've done and make the necessary changes. 
So Portuguese mainstream schooling now, um, literacy in the national language in Portuguese and following mainstream curricular content is the way to citizenship. This does not mean abandoning uh, indigenous languages and uh, indigenous knowledges. And the place for indigenous languages and knowledges is elsewhere, not from the perspective of these communities in the four, within the four walls of the schoolhouse. So the indigenous communities ac acutely perceive these connections and they strive to connect indigenous education with mainstream schooling. Now, the, one of the perspectives, that, or if they're going to be teaching uh, mainstream knowledges in, a, in the four walls of a classroom, uh, they're going to be repeating, um, it's a, referring back to Freire there, they're just repeating the oppression which was used to exclude them. But in practice, and this is a, a, at a practical grassroots classroom level, when an indigenous teacher is interpreting the national curriculum, located within a body of indigenous knowledge, that curriculum means something else. The concept of history, uh, national history, the history of the state, the Brazilian state, where only recently we accept that we were no longer discovered, but we were invaded. Uh, when this is told by an indigenous teacher, it's something else. When science, mainstream science, is taught by an indigenous teacher, well aware of his own indigenous knowledges and concepts of science, is something else. So it's time we uh, we reflected on on this and not just look at this, reject uh, this this option as uh, uh, interjected self-oppression. So EFA proposals as they stand at the moment, emphasize literacy as a basis for education. We can't do anything without literacy. And this literacy following the, the, the indigenous education legislation has to be in the indigenous language. But literacy, as we know from our academic literary theoreticians, is social and cultural practice. It's not, no longer seen as simply a linguistic uh, code. Uh, indigenous communities have their own forms of non-alphabetic, non-humanist, uh, visual literacy, and I'm not going to, I don't have time to go into what I mean by non-humanist, but it's this perception that uh, there's no distinction between human forms of life and animal forms of life and plant forms of life and mineral forms of life. They're all interconnected. And this has got to do with what uh, their concept of visual literacy. And here I'm going to take just two examples. This is a YMP writing, and I consider, consider this to be writing. Um, from a transdisciplinary perspective, people who work with literacy have difficulty with considering this of writing. From the Eastern Amazonia, if we understand writing as a registration, in this case on paper, of knowledge, and not simply a registration or representation of sounds or verbal language, then here we have writing. Each drawing has a name. Each drawing refers to a narrative, so it's a kind of an icon, which refers to a they either they refer to events or characters in narratives. So when you when when a member of this community sees one of these uh, uh, forms, they uh, they remember immediately a, a narrative, and that narrative is a symbolic way of harboring a certain form of knowledge. So here we have right, not alphabetic, but right. This is from. Um, the other extreme of uh, the eastern Amazonia, here we have something like uh, nearly 2,000 kilometers between one, one extreme and the other. Uh, the Kashinawa people of uh, eastern Amazonia. And here, these are again cultures of vision, not cultures of voice. These are non-humanist cultures. And here, this is how they write. This, uh, on, on the lower picture, is a history and geography of uh, this nation as perceived by them. Right, so we have um, the drawings refer to events in their history, and they refer to different communities located in different places where the rivers are in yellow. The rivers are the main forms of communication. This is what I mean by.